Welcome to the Liberty Baptist Sermon Archives. The message you're about to hear was preached at Liberty Baptist Church in Easton, Massachusetts. You can find out more about us or contact us at mylibertybaptist.org or just look us up on Facebook. And now we hope that this message from God's Word will be a blessing to you. Same with chapter number 16 this evening. We are, and if you also would turn to Luke chapter number 13 as well, put your ribbon there and... I'm going to have us turn there quickly at the end of the message. So put your ribbon in Luke chapter 13, but we will be in 1 Samuel chapter number 16 for most of the message this evening. Let me be transparent with you for just a minute about our series here in 1 Samuel and particularly about Saul himself. And I'm just, again, being transparent with you tonight. I'm kind of tired of Saul. I'm not going to lie. You know, I'm tired of him. I am tired of this what I believe one of the more whiny, sniveling characters that you are going to find in the Bible. I enjoy being able to highlight those first few years of his ministry where he had humility and where things were going well, but I mean, we are just going to see him descend into bitterness and madness to the point that by the end of his life, he is unrecognizable from the humble young man who was anointed by Samuel all those years ago. In many ways, I'm tired of him. But let me put it to you this way. I don't want to be, understand what I'm about to say to you this evening. I'm not trying to be strange in how I say it. Maybe it'll come across that way. But if I am tired of Saul, and perhaps you are tired of Saul, how tired of Saul do you think God was? I know God tires, not in the same way that we tire. I'm not trying to make an equivalency of that tonight. But Saul isn't sinning against us. Saul hasn't harmed me one bit. In fact, I would say this, we have benefited from Saul's life and even his mistakes because we're getting to learn the things not to do by dissecting his life. But how much has God's heart been hurt by Saul knowing from the foundation of the world that Saul would make the choices that he was going to make, that God still loved the world, God still loved Israel, but God so loved Israel. Saul, Saul, the son of Kish, of the tribe of Benjamin, that his heart would be grieved by what he was doing and the decisions that he was making. Now, I think when we look at our text tonight, we're going to see the shift take place in Saul's life. We highlighted it last week in verse number 14 very quickly as we looked at the difference between David, a man who had the Spirit of God, and Saul, one who lost the Spirit of God. But that losing of the Spirit came with consequences. That losing of the Spirit was to change Saul's life fundamentally forever. And the fact that the Spirit was taken away from him could be to us a signal that God had given up on Saul. But the fact of the matter is this this evening, despite Saul's backsliding, God never gave up on him. Despite the fact that Saul stiff-armed God, yet God was still at work. And I believe we're going to see in our text tonight that even when it seems like God has discarded the backslider, God is still at work. Even when it seems that God has discarded the backslider, He is still in the background at work. Now, that may not be exciting to you if you've never been a backslider. But for most of us in the real world, who have taken some time away from our walk with the Lord, whether physically, being away from church, being away from our Bibles, being away from close fellowship and prayer, or maybe those who never left those things bodily, but their heart was so far from God. You make, it makes you want to think that God would just like a piece of paper wad us up and toss us away. But yet right here we see that God has grace for the backslider. This morning, well, this morning was another message. This evening, if you are far from God, there's hope for you because there was hope for Saul. And this evening, if nothing else, if you're right with God, but you've had some times in your life where you are not where you're supposed to be, could I tell you tonight, there's cause for rejoicing that God never gave up on you. And He never gave up on me despite falling far short of what we ought to be spiritually. Would you stand, please, for the reading of God's Word? 
We're in 1 Samuel chapter number 16. We'll begin in verse number 14 where we left off last week. But the spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servants said unto him, Behold, now, an evil spirit from the Lord troubleth thee. Let our Lord now command thy servants, which are before thee, to seek out a man who is a cunning player on the harp, and it shall come to pass, when the evil spirit from God is upon thee, that he shall play with his hand, and thou shalt be well. And Saul said unto his servants, Provide me now a man that can play well, and bring him to me. Then answered one of the servants, and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing, and a mighty valiant man, and a man of war, and prudent in matters, and a comely person. And look at this, the Lord was with him. Wherefore Saul sent messengers unto Jesse, who said, Send me David thy son, which is with the sheep. And Jesse took an ass laden with bread, and a bottle of wine, and a kid, and sent them by David his son unto Saul. By the way, when it says he sent a kid, they didn't just pick a child at random. It's talking about a goat. Let's just be clear in our King James Bibles. We're talking about, hey, kid, get over here. Uh, We've got to send you with David. And a little King James humor right there. All right, there we go. And, uh, and David said unto Saul, and uh, came to Saul, and stood before him, and he loved him greatly, and he became his armor bearer. And Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Let David, I pray thee, stand before me, for he hath found favor in my sight. And it came to pass, when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul, that David took an harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. There's a lot going on in this text as far as the life of Saul and his walk with God. But the title of my message this evening is this, God's grace to the backslider. Aren't you glad for God's grace to the backslider? Why don't you be seated and we'll pray together. Heavenly Father, I do ask that you be with me this evening, that my thoughts would be biblical and right. Lord, that we'd be encouraging this evening. And Lord, it's not upon my heart that this is a church that is far from you or that the people of this church are far from you. In fact, quite the opposite. I know that there are many who have had stories, backstories that are hard or difficult or tragic, but yet through it all, you have brought them through by your grace. Lord, if nothing else, may tonight be an encouragement to those people. If there is someone, whether they are listening in this room or they're listening within the confines of their home or their car through the digital means that we have available, there's someone who just is not right with you. Lord, I pray that they would hear, they would consider, and they would be wise. That while God's grace is real to the backslider, it's not infinite. And it's not everlasting. And Lord, may they take heed of these things here tonight from a good God as presented from your word. And we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. I ended with verse number 14 last week, and I had mentioned that it was an ominous sign of things to come. And you'll see that there is this evil spirit in verse number 14, and it's also mentioned in verse number 15, from the Lord. Now, if that troubles you to hear this phrase, an evil spirit from the Lord, we'll try to address it here uh, in just a moment. But I will say that what we have going on here in a larger sense, if we were summarizing this text, is this, is that Saul, who once walked with God, is not walking with God. And there are consequences to the decisions of life that we make when we make decisions particularly that are against the word of God. And Saul has repeatedly transgressed God's word, thinking he was above God's word because he was the king, neglecting that there is a king of kings and a lord of lords. And because of that, there were some consequences in his life. We know that if you sow wild oats, you will receive a wild harvest. You sow to the wind and you'll reap the whirlwind. And that's what's happening in Saul's life. And one of the great consequences was this, was that an evil spirit was upon him as the Holy Spirit departed from him. And because of that, he was prone to having episodes where we'll find out later where he had a little bit of a temper problem, you know, like throwing javelins and such, you know, that could be a problem. Uh, And having just this evil spirit come upon him and maybe manifesting itself in, in several different ways. We don't know all of the ways that it is, but we do know this, that his servants saw this and his servants had realized this man needs help. And so, through a course of conversation, what do we see? They say, there is this son of Jesse, and his name is David. 
and he is a man of character. Do you see how they explained him in verse number 18? It says, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, that is cunning and playing. Okay, so he is skillful in music. A mighty, valiant man. We know from the next chapter when we get there that David had already had an encounter with a lion and a bear and that he had protected his sheep in such an incredible way that no doubt the word had gotten out to other people about his great exploits through the power of God. It said, and a man of war. And I don't know exactly how that would be, but I know this. The word of God says it, so he was a man of war. And if we're not sure about that. He certainly would prove himself to be such as the word of God reveals that to us later on. Prudent in matters, a comely person. And most importantly, more importantly than any of those other things, what? God was with him. Because listen, you can be a great musician, you can be a great soldier, you can be someone who makes good decisions, but in the end, if the Lord's not with you, what do those things matter? What do those things add up to? Because many of those things could have been said of Saul. Someone who had looked at tall Saul not that long ago would have said, this is the man that can lead us to the promised land. You know, no pun intended. But what do we find? Because he didn't have the Lord with him. And because even when the Lord was with him, he refused to listen. He stiff-armed the Holy Spirit. So what happens? The Holy Spirit, in essence, says this. You want to make these decisions by yourself? Then you can make these decisions by yourself. And it affected Saul, and it affected his spirit. But we find, listen, they chose David. What do we see here? The providence of God. Now, what's the odds that this situation takes place? David has just been anointed a few verses ago. And someone says, hey, I got a great guy that you should, Saul, that you should get to know and that you should bring into the palace. It's this man named David. He's a young man and he's got these things going for him that are really good. The Lord's with him. He can play the harp really well. Wouldn't you like to have him part of the palace? And in essence, the servant's not realizing that they're inviting the next king of the palace into the palace. That's the providence of God, friend, that God is in control of affairs. By the way, this isn't the message, but let's just throw this in here. God is the one who elevates, and God is the one who brings down. We have no need to elevate ourselves. We have no need to try to bring ourselves up or to make ourselves into something that we are not. God is very capable of bringing up. And by the way, God is a very capable of bringing down as well as we see one man's trajectory going up and the other man's trajectory going down. So David is brought before Saul, and he starts to play, and it says that he played the harp, and we would call this harp today maybe more of a liar, maybe you would see, not like liar, like pants on fire type liar, but you understand the kind of liar that would be a smaller type harp that maybe you would hold off to the side, not where someone was maybe sitting down and had a harp that was maybe as tall as a person would be. Uh, that would have been more traditionally the type of harp that they would have used, and so David when Saul had this evil spirit come upon him, David would be brought out. He would play the harp in such a way, and it says in verse number 23, and it came to pass when the evil spirit from God was upon Saul that David took an harp and played with his hand, so Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. Listen, that's the grace of God in Saul's life. Saul did not deserve even a moment of refreshment. Saul did not deserve even a moment of being within his right mind. But yet God, by the way, knowing the end, God knew the end of this account before the beginning. Let me say that again. God knew the end of this account before the beginning, as in before in the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. But yet what do we find? That Saul was given this measure of grace despite his backsliding. I'll be honest with you. I tire so often of people who do not understand the Bible, but then they try to portray themselves as knowing the Bible, saying something like this, boy, that God of the Bible is an angry God. That God of the Bible is just smiting people all the time. Smiting here and smiting there and eliminating nations here and sending a great flood and doing all these different things. I do find this, that while there was a great flood, Noah found grace in the eyes of the Lord. I do find that Israel was very stubborn and rebellious towards God. But we saw that he sent prophet after prophet after prophet for generation after generation after generation to them just to be able to try to draw them back to him. 
over and over again, even to the point that as I was just mentioning this morning, reading the book of Malachi today, very easy to read all four chapters just in one sitting, and as the Israelites around 450 B.C. are saying, God, what have you done for us lately? You say that you're good, but you're not as good as you say that you are in question, in question, in question. And even then, God's silent for about 450 years. But then what comes next? John the Baptist and Jesus Christ. And as the end of the Old Testament ends with the two words, a curse, the beginning of Jesus' ministry in Matthew chapter 5 begins with this, blessed. The grace of God manifested over and over and over again. And I believe there's several different ways we see that in our text and some ways that maybe we can relate with here tonight as well. And first of all, I see this. God sent a servant. God sent a servant. A, a method of God's grace in Saul's life was that he sent a servant. And we can start with the servants who were spiritually perceptive in verse number 15, where they said, And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold now, an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. He had some servants. He had some people who were working for him that were able to identify something that was wrong in his life. And I will say, it's good to not just surround ourselves in our lives with people that just nod their heads and agree with us with everything that we're doing in our life. That it's important for us to be able to have people around us that are spiritually perceptive. That when we start to backslide and we start to make decisions that are not right, that it's a pastor, it's an assistant pastor, it's a Sunday school teacher, uh, it's a trusted friend in the church, uh, it's a leader in the church that can come up to you and say something like this, I know the way that you're going right now, but I've seen that, I've been that way, and I just want to warn you in love that this is not right. These are the type of people that we need to have in our life. But what I found is true. True, that the backslider often will do this over time, replaces the faithful with those who will answer what they want to hear. Now, how do I know that? Well, here in Samuel, 1 Samuel, rather, chapter number 16, Saul has some servants and says, Saul has a problem. We need to minister to him spiritually and find someone who will help. But by the time we get to the end of 1 Samuel, Saul can't hear from God at all. I mean, God has literally just shut the door on him until he repents. And what does he do? He turns to his servants and they said this. There's a town called Endor. And in Endor, there's a witch. Let's go talk to her. You know what happened? Somewhere along the way, the backslider rejected the grace of God and started taking the spiritual help that was in their life and replacing them with people of the world. So we're at the end of Saul's life when he should have had servants that said, Saul, what are you doing? You, you want to go to a witch? You outlawed witches. You were the one that years ago said that they were to die because that was what God's law has said. And now you're trying to go speak to one? Why don't you just get right with God? But those friends, those servants were gone. And he'd replace them with the people who told him what they wanted to hear. You know, there are times that people will tell us maybe something that we do not want to hear. Can I just remind you that it's important for us to take what is said, to pray over, and to consider, and to consider other godly counsel around us as well. That doesn't mean that it's always, that, uh, that doesn't mean always that someone who gives a critique or someone that is telling you is right. In fact, sometimes they're way off. But I will say this, there ought to be a pause, there ought to be a thought, there ought to be prayer, and we ought to consider those things in our life as here David, uh, or rather Saul did as well. And whilst God's grace was to give him these servants, God's greatest grace through a servant was through David. Not just these servants who were named in general, but specifically David. And it said that he was a man who the Lord was with him. Could I tell you, the people that you really need to be around in your life is the people that the Lord is with them. That doesn't mean that when you get together, all you do is talk about the Bible and all you do is talk about what church services were like and those kind of things. And We're real people. We're well-rounded people, and don't take this the wrong way. I'm not saying that, that, that good, godly conversation isn't an important thing, but we can't always talk about our Bible reading. But we still need to be able to have good conversations with people that are godly and talk about the things of life. 
with people that are godly, to keep us sharp and to keep us right, who enjoy our interests and who enjoy talking about various subjects, but through it all can help keep us on the right path. And then when we stray a little bit, they can say, hey, what are you doing? Where have you been? Why would you say that? Why would you think that way? And we must, when those times come, give heed and at least consider whether those voices are right because they're servants that God has sent us. I think of a couple people in my life who were a blessing to me, especially as a young person. One was the man who led me to the Lord. His name's Steve Baker. I was able to preach for him back in February, back in Florida, for their church's anniversary. Led me to Christ. But then after I got led to Christ, I made some bad decisions. And I started to go back to the very world that God had saved me from. Because I had the pressure of other teenagers, my friends, my, well, let me put it this way, my friends, and I also wasn't really getting a lot of encouragement from home about being born again. I told my parents that I got saved, and they said, why? Because they figured, well, why would you go through that process? Because you were baptized when you were a baby. So I'd have that conversation with them, many conversations with them. So after a while, I kind of just got discouraged and said, you know, forget it. This whole thing's, I don't even know if it's worth it. I'm thankful for times that Steve Baker, my youth pastor, would call me into his office, and he would say, Adam, what are you doing? Sometimes he would say it like that. But you know what I knew? Because he was around me and we'd play basketball and he'd drive me back and forth to events, he'd invested in me, he earned the right to be able to say that to me. I, you know what? I didn't listen to him at first. In fact, I thought he was crazy. But then I realized that one who is not in their right mind can't evaluate whether someone else is crazy. And spiritually, when you're not in your right mind, you cannot evaluate whether other people are right with the Lord or not. I'm thankful for Steve Baker. During that same time, I had a science teacher. Her name was Leona Rossiter. And I remember, I think I've told the story before, coming down the stairs at Westgate. It was between classes or something, but there was hardly anyone in the, in the hall at that time. It was a school, at the time it was a fairly large school for a Christian school, around 400 students or so. And I was coming down the, the steps, and she says, Adam, I need to talk to you for a minute. I said, Okay, that's, that's fine. And she basically said the same, what's the matter with you? She says, you preached in church. And now you're not living like someone who's a preacher. You said you're called to preach. And she, I mean, she read me the riot act. And I thought, who does this woman think she is? Doesn't she know she's supposed to be submissive to me? Uh, this 16-year-old pimply teenage boy, a cement lady. Um, but do you know what I realized? This woman had enough tenacity and spiritual care for my life that God sent a servant my way that was willing to say something to me. You know, I'm still friends with Steve Baker and Leona Rossiter today. I consider them ministry friends. You know, Leona Rossiter, her husband, Richard Rossiter, that church has supported this church since before the beginning. Tell me that's not God's grace. But for every story that I have, you have some of people that you thought were jerks. But could I just put it this way? You were being the jerk, spiritually speaking. You just didn't want to hear what they had to say. But do you realize God's grace, the backsliders, he sends you these people. He sends you a pastor. He sends you a mentor. He sends you a friend. He sends them to you to speak of the things of the Lord. Don't ever get over that. And by the way, to flip the script here a little bit, you be that person to somebody. You receive that, you be that to somebody that needs help. God's grace is evident that he sent a servant, but also God's grace is evident in this way. God sent a song. God sent a song. You say, oh, pastor, you love alliteration. You're just going to throw a song in there because it's a letter S and servant's a letter S. And you'll probably have another letter S. And the answer is, well, I do uh, have another one that's coming up. But the I issue is this. It's right there in the text. And I think sometimes we forget the power that music has in our lives. That music is one of the most powerful forces that God has given us that affects our mood that can affect the very way that we conduct ourselves. That there are times that we are sad and maybe we want to marinate in that sadness, so what do we do? We play a sad song. There are times we are sad and we know we should be encouraged and we play a song that should help give some encouragement or maybe levity or joy 
to our life, that music has that type of power. I've mentioned before that when I sold jewelry, we literally had a Muzak machine. That's a company, Muzak, that sells elevator music and is the kind of music at K Jewelers that was supposed to make you want to fall in love all over again. And really what that means is this, we're going to sell you jewelry all over again. Because the music's just right and the lighting's just right and all of a sudden you got that one carrot right on the hand and I realize I'm going to be able to pay my school bill if they make this, uh, if they make this payment. You know, ten, 10 easy low payments, all right? Uh, why do they do that? Scientifically speaking, music has power. Why is it important that we sing in church? Because music doesn't just prepare our heart for the preaching. It ministers to us spiritually. I think it's important that, you know, sometimes people say, well, the music prepares us for the message. The playing of the piano plays, it prepares us for the message. And the uh, special music, when we're able to have it by God's grace, prepares the heart for the message. And that's true. But it's not the pregame show. And the preaching is the show. It's all part of what God uses to, you, to get our heart to where it needs to be. You know, there are times I would never have listened to a sermon. Or maybe I was sitting in church and I would have physically heard the sermon, but I wouldn't have heard with ears that heard. You understand what I'm saying? But God did something through the song service. Amazing love. How can it be that thou, my God, would die for me just as I am without one plea? That thy blood was shed for me? That thou biddest come, call to me, Lamb of God, I come. I come. Amazing grace, how sweet the sound, that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now I'm found blind, but now I see. God has given us music as a gift. And particularly for the backslider. And there are times the word of God will not penetrate the heart, but that the music of the Lord, I'm talking about the right kind of music, can soften our heart to make us where we need to be. Say, well, pastor, can you prove it? Well, I'm glad you asked. David wrote some songs. He was a songwriter. He said, well, I thought he wrote psalms. Right. They're songs. David wrote many of the hymns of Israel. You could say he was the writer of the hymnal of Israel, the psalms. David, that same man that we see here. In Psalm 42, verses 5, and then verse 8 to follow, it says, Why art thou cast down, O my soul? Why art thou disquieted in me? Hope thou in God, for I shall yet praise him for the help of his countenance. Yet the Lord will command his loving kindness in the daytime, and in the night his song shall be with me. And my prayer unto the God of my life. What about Colossians 3.16? This is not the only place we find this. Let the word of God dwell in you richly in all wisdom, teaching and admonishing one another in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs singing with grace in your hearts to the Lord. Do you know why it's so important that we sing in church? Because even the singing is preparing ourselves to sing to the Lord. And we're singing not for the audience that is here, but for the audience of one, which is the Lord. Say, well, I can't sing very well. We'll sing anyway. Well, people don't want to hear me sing. Well, that's their problem. You say, you talk tough. I don't care. I don't care. I'm thankful that God has given me a voice that at least is not like contrary to people's senses. But people aren't asking me to sing on tour groups and things like that like other people of our family. Not that I'm bitter about that at all. I was asked not to try out when I was at Heartland, but that's okay. It's all right. But whether your voice is grand or not so grand or anywhere in between, you know who it sounds great to? It sounds great to the Lord. Amen. Speaking unto yourselves in psalms and hymns and spiritual songs. The Bible says make a joyful noise unto the Lord. And by the way, sometimes our voice just may sound like noise to people. But it's a beautiful noise in the ears of God. Let's be a singing church. Let's be the church that will sing out with all of our heart, not caring what other people think. Do you know why? Because it's a sign of grace that God has brought us. And by the way, our singing joyfully could do something in the heart of a backslider that's here. So these people, they're singing like they mean it. These people are smiling when they're singing. I know I'm asking a lot now. First sing out and then sing and smile. I know, Pastor, you are, this is one of the most unreasonable sermons you've ever had. I know. But to actually sing and be joyful about it, but that could minister to someone's heart. 
I always love watching choirs, and sometimes I get to watch the choir at Southwest where Bethany and, and Kaylee are, and, and Beethoven and Chucky, and I get to watch their choir, and I love watching the people that love being in the choir. I'm not talking about the people that like, they love being seen. I'm talking about the people that just love singing. You know what's amazing? I can't tell what their voice sounds like. I can't hear them. But you know what sticks out to me? The joy of Jesus. If you're discouraged, can I encourage you? Put on some gospel music in your home. Put on some hymns. Put on some instrumental hymns. If you have Spotify or if you have Amazon Music or if you have any of those programs uh, on your phone or on your computer or even if you have, imagine this, CDs. You can have eight tracks. It's okay. Whatever you have. Just play them and use them to allow God to minister to your heart. Because he gave a song, it ministered to Saul. When Saul listened to it, he was refreshed. He was helped because he was able to minister him into a way that he wasn't otherwise able to be ministered to. So God sent a servant. He sent a song. But I also see this. He sent the Spirit. He sent the Spirit. You say, woo hoo hoo Your alliteration got a little bit out of hand there, Pastor. Because it doesn't say he sent the Spirit. It says he took away the spirit and sent an evil spirit. And I have to agree with that. Let's go back to verse number 13 and read through verse 15. Then Samuel took the horn of oil and anointed him in the midst of his brethren. And the spirit of the Lord came upon David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. And I believe the juxtaposition of these two verses together is not a mistake. To have David receive the Spirit and then Saul lose the Spirit. Look at verse 14. But the Spirit of the Lord departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from the Lord troubled him. And Saul's servant said unto him, Behold, now an evil spirit from God troubleth thee. Now how could an evil spirit come from God, given his holy and righteous nature? That might seem a little troublesome to some people, but I believe there's a couple of answers to that here today, and it could be either one of these. Uh, first, this evil spirit could stem from God's subtraction. Actively, God never initiates or performs evil. Could we agree with that tonight? He is the father of lights of whom there is no variableness, neither shadow of turning. Passively, God may withdraw his hand of protection and therefore allow evil to come without being the source of evil itself. That could be the possibility. That as he removes the Spirit of the Lord from him, the natural progression would be that this evil spirit would enter, and so it was God's action in removing it that brought this evil spirit. We could look at it that way. It could also stem just from the fact of God's sovereignty. Scripture portrays God as sovereign over all aspects of creation, including both good and evil forces. This doesn't mean that God is the author of evil but that he can use anything or any event to accomplish his purposes. In the case of Saul, God may have allowed an evil spirit to trouble Saul to accomplish his purposes. Say, does that ever happen in the word of God? Well, consider Job. A different situation, no doubt, because Job was righteous. But what happened? God in his sovereignty allowed this evil spirit, Satan, and his minions to attack Job. Was God the author of it? No. Was God sovereign? Yes. Could it be said that that came from God? Well, it could have been because we recognize that God was in control through the entire situation. So either way, don't allow those passages, particularly verses 14 and 15, to trouble you because God is not the author of evil, that God is not the source of evil. Uh, we know that He is the source of everything that is good and that is right and that is holy in life. But in saying that, that God sent the Spirit, God did send him the Spirit. How? Through David. And you say, oh, now you're, you're, you're making some kind of wordplay here. No, no, I'm being serious. That even as God removed the Spirit from Saul, what did he do? He brought a Spirit-led servant into his life. And I know we talked about this already, but it wasn't just that he brought a godly servant. He brought the Spirit of the Lord back to him, not in his own life, but through someone else. That's God's grace. God could have said, I'm not going to have any God, anyone godly anywhere near this man. But he said this, David, you go. You say, why would he do that? One, because he was trying to accomplish something in Saul's heart. But two, he was trying to accomplish something in David's heart. Because even then, what was he doing? He was preparing David for his future kingdom. Today, God does send His Spirit 
as grace to the backslider. Why? Because in this era that we live in, in this dispensation, if you will, that we live in, once we are saved, the Holy Spirit continues to live inside of us. Aren't you thankful that the Holy Spirit doesn't come and go today like he did for Saul or like he did for Samson, who wist not that the Spirit was gone? And he got up as in other times and he tried to throw, a, throw his hair out and pop off all those, those uh, restraints upon him and fight the Philistines. And he realized in that moment, the Spirit's gone. And his eyes were put out. And his life fundamentally was over at that point. But for us, God's grace is this. When we're saved, we are sealed with the Holy Spirit of promise. When we fall far away from God, He still allows His Holy Spirit to work inside of us. Now we must be careful because we can quench the Spirit. We must be careful because we can take the Spirit's power in our life and like a fire that has been allowed to go down to its embers, we can allow the fire of the Holy Spirit to burn down to such place because he's ignored. That's why we're told, quench not the Spirit. But the Spirit's still with us. What is that? That's God's grace. I'm thankful that even when the world, and maybe even other Christians thought, there's not much to this guy, that the Holy Spirit lived inside of me and was willing to work with me and to help me. And you can say whatever you want to say about who I am today, but whatever I am today, I am by the grace of God in my life but you could say the same thing. Aren't you glad God never gave up on you? Aren't you glad that God didn't get tired of you like other people got tired of you? Aren't you glad God didn't get tired of you like maybe even you got tired of yourself? Got tired of looking in the mirror at who you were and who you became, but yet there was one who was still patiently working with you, and that was the Lord, who could bring a servant who can bring a song and bring a spirit. Turn quickly to Luke, if you will. Luke chapter 13. We'll end with this. Was God's grace effective in Saul's life? I'd answer it this way. No. Say, Pastor, you just undercut the whole sermon. I don't believe I have. And here's the reason why. It's not because God isn't sovereign. Because he is sovereign. We just covered that. But that his sovereignty allows us to answer this question in our own life. What will you do with Christ? What will you do with this grace that has been given to you? Listen, God heaps upon us grace upon grace upon grace, but if in our free will we refuse to humble ourselves before Him, then is God's grace effective? It would have been, but it was not allowed to be made effective in our life. God is a very patient God. God is far more patient with us than we are with others and that we are with ourselves. But I will tell you this, God's graciousness has a time limit. To the backslider, God's graciousness is not infinite. How long is it? Well, we could say till death, and certainly there could be something to that, but I believe it could be even shorter than that. We know for the unbeliever that Romans chapter 1 says that there is a time we push God away so much, or when those people, I should say, because I'm not talking about saved people, but when those people push God away so much that they are given up to a reprobate mind, meaning this, that God says this, I'm going to give you what you want that I'm, I, I will not force myself upon you, but I will give you what you want, which is the absence of my presence. And that's when unspeakable things take place. And you can look at that list in Romans chapter 1, and it basically looks like America in 2024. For the backslider, God's grace is not infinite, and I cannot tell you what the timetable is. For Saul, I don't know how long. For Solomon, or well, we could say Solomon, but I'm uh, thinking of Samson. We don't know how long. But I do know this. While we don't know an exact time period, the backslider should never count on the fact that it will be infinite. Because thou knowest not what a day will bring forth. 
Look at what it says in Luke chapter number 13, verse 6. Jesus gives this parable and he says this. He spake also this parable. A certain man had a fig tree planted in his vineyard, and he came and sought fruit thereon and found none. And he said unto the dresser of his vineyard, Behold, these three years I come seeking fruit on the fig tree and find none. Cut it down. Why cumbereth it in the ground? And he, excuse me, answering, said unto him, Lord, let it alone this year also, till I shall dig about it and dung it. And if it bear fruit, well, and if not, then after that shall it be cut down. What is Jesus saying here? That there was a plant that after several years did not bring forth fruit. And the master says, get rid of it. And the servant says, well, before we do, why don't we give it one more chance? Why don't we give it everything that we can possibly give it? We, we'll dig around it to make sure the root system is as it should be. And it, it's free of weeds and anything else that could be maybe taking away nutrients from the plant. We dung it, meaning that it, it gets the proper fertilization that it needs to make sure that it has as many nutrients as possible. We give it every possible chance. But if it refuses to grow, then it's gone. Do you realize what God expects from his children? Fruit. You know what the backslider does not produce? Fruit. And we see for three years, multiple seasons, it was expected and not received. And yet despite that, even though the master had every reason to get rid of it, he still allowed one more season. Could we put it this way? One more bit of grace. He says, I'm going to give everything I can to it. And if this plant refuses to grow, then its time is up. The backslider's grace is real, but it is not infinite. God's grace is effective, but it's only rendered effective to those who are willing to take it, receive it, and be helped. I'm thankful for God's grace. I'm thankful for His grace in my life. No doubt you are as well. But be sure about this. If you have taken God's grace and you have pushed it away for some time, God's grace will still be there in your life, but you don't know for how long. So take advantage of it today because God wants to do a work in your life. Pastor, who are you talking to? A bunch of people on Sunday night. I mean, we're good people. We're here on Sunday night. Right? I see around here people that struggle just like anyone else struggles. And that just because we're dressed up nice and we're here on a Sunday night and we smell nice and, you know, we act nice to each other, that doesn't mean that we don't struggle in our heart and maybe are actually much farther from God than what we want people to see who are here in this building. I want you to know this. If that's you, God has abundant grace available for you. But don't wait too long because you don't know how long it's available. And if you have been helped by that, by that grace over the years, would you be that conduit to help someone else? Be a servant that's willing to be a blessing to someone who's gone the wrong way like you have gone the wrong way. Be willing to give a song. That doesn't mean you need to be in a choir or sing a special and, or anything like that, but allow that music, even in church, to joyfully come from within you to minister to others, and to be spirit-led. See, David was a talented man, but his greatest gift was this, he followed the Lord because he was just as talented as many ways as Saul was. But Saul wouldn't follow the Lord, and David would. Who is God pleased with? The one who followed him. Do not wait on God's grace if you're the backslider. And if you have experienced that in your life in the past, but God's given you victory, praise God. Be helped someone else who's on that path you used to be on. Thank you for listening to this sermon from the pulpit of Liberty Baptist Church. If this message was a blessing to you, or if there's any way we can serve you, please let us know by contacting us at info at mylibertybaptist.org, or you can visit us this Sunday at 800 Washington Street in Easton, Massachusetts. May the Lord bless you as you grow in His Word.